Hi, everyone. Um, tonight, I'm going to be talking about the skies of February for this year, 2024. And so let's begin. All right, I guess uh, we'll start with today because everything else in February previously is all have has passed. So why talk about that? Um, if you're an early morning riser or an early morning stargazer, uh, you may have noticed we have a beautiful waning crescent moon um, rising in the southeast just before sunrise. And to the left of that, you may have noticed brilliant, bright Venus in the sky. And also, if, you're, if you've got a keen eye, you may be able to detect Mars, although it's really difficult right now because it is bathed in the light of the sun. Skirting along the horizon is also Mercury there um, down in the left corner. Um, but the moon was really, really beautiful. Uh, we're heading in towards a new moon, which is just two nights from now. On the 9th, we'll have the darkest of skies. And so the, the planets are not really visible in the nighttime sky right now. We've only got Jupiter that's visible. Um, but right now, the other remaining planets, including Jupiter too, are starting to march towards the sun. And um, as you're all aware, on uh, April 8th, we're just uh, a little, one day less than two months away from a total solar eclipse that will occur in the United States and upstate New York. And I, this is not something that I had even thought of. I, I, you know, the total solar eclipse is a really cool thing to see. Um, and I know that stars come out in the middle of the day, but I didn't take into account the planets that might be visible during that eclipse. So um, bring up Stellarium where we can see exactly uh, what's visible during totality. Um, we have most of the planets visible, um, a little hard to see here. Aldebaran is the star that's up at the very top of the screen there. And let me see if I can annotate here and get my uh, pointer working. Mm -hmm. It won't allow me to do it. Okay, so above, uh, the eclipse there, you'll you'll see um, Jupiter, uh, Venus, and down low on the horizon, you've got Ve uh, Saturn and Mars. So you've got all of the planets visible during the total wow. solar eclipse. Um, so you know, keep that in mind if you're going to take a road trip to see totality. Um, you'll you'll if you've never witnessed this before, the the temperature drops tremendously. Uh, stars come out, you'll see the outer corona of the sun extend out off of the limb of the sun. And it looks like a hole torn out in the middle of the universe. Is it visible here? Or do you have to go uh, here in, on Long Island, we will not uh, see a total solar eclipse. We will see a partial eclipse where I believe 90% of the, the, uh, the surface of the sun will be covered, but just that little sliver that remains left, it'll look like an ordinary day, maybe a little bit dimmer here, but we won't see actual totality. You have to go to Rochester, Buffalo. It comes through New York State, but up in that area. It starts in Texas and travels through New York and up through Vermont and then, and then out. Um, but the, the, the width of the umbra, the dark part of the, um, uh, the shadow of the sun is only about 50 miles wide on average. So you have to get under that umbra. Um, I think a lot of us are taking road trips, I'm going to the Ithaca area and then driving west. Um, so yeah, mark your you calendar, need, it's you worth a road trip. Uh, you, need a, you need special glasses to see uh, the eclipse, but once it goes into to to totality, you can remove your glasses and look at it with your eyes. Um, and this is what you'll see. Um, minus, uh, minus the, um, you'll have a red horizon glow that goes all the way around you. Um, so, but, but here, the arrangement of the planets are all there for you to see during totality. This did not occur in 2017 during the last total solar eclipse. So um, this, is, this is special because of that. I'm sorry, what, what didn't occur? Um, in 2017, we didn't have all five visible oh, planets, planets out during right. the daytime. Yeah. So what, there's no other opportunity for you to see without the use of special equipment. Uh, the stars and planets during the daytime because of the, the light of the sun. So why do you recommend is the best 
places not too far and you go to um within a reasonable driving distance i you know lake erie area or you know look at um look at eclipse maps if you google total solar eclipse of 2024 eclipse path it'll show you where it goes from texas all the way up and then you've got to get under that point um, but you know it tends to be cloudy this time of year especially so um we'll be lucky if we get a clear sky but let's hope that is the case it's worth the drive to see totality if the weather's going to be okay yeah definitely it's like nothing else you've ever seen right Okay, um, back to February, back to this month. Um, so at about eight o'clock PM during the month of February, and I, I think I picked February 15th as a midway point to show this, and it won't change too much on either end of the 15th of the month. Um, if you're facing south, you get a, you have a really beautiful display of some of the brightest stars for any season. Um, a lot of people think that the stars are really bright during the winter time because the, the air is cold and dense and they appear brighter. But for the most part, the stars in the winter time are brighter because um, when we look out and see the Milky Way in a really dark sky sight, we're looking towards the outer edge of our galaxy. But those stars in the arm of the galaxy are actually closer to us. So the reason that they're brighter, some of them are intrinsically brighter, but for the most part, these stars are closer to us um, than the summer stars in the Milky Way. So that's why the stars in the winter appear so bright. Um, some of the conspicuous stars that we'll see here, the one at the top is called Capella, which I think is probably the most beautiful name of a star. Um, and then you have the bow tie shape or the hourglass shape of Orion the Hunter. Unfortunately, my, my um, PowerPoint is not allowing me to annotate or point anything out. So for the folks at home, I'm, I'm sorry, you can't, I can't point that out. Um, there's something called the celestial G. So if you take some of the brightest stars in the winter sky, and again, you're facing south towards Orion, you'll connect the stars here from Capella and then move to the left, you hit Castor and Pollux, Procyon, Sirius, Rigel, you come up to Aldebaran in the V-shaped face of Taurus and then you zip back to Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse and that is known as the G. I've seen this drawn in different ways, many different times, but this is the one that I kind of see. And um, if you go out and try and observe this tonight or over the next couple of nights, <clears throat> just don't count Jupiter <laughs> in that celestial G. So that really the brightest object out there will be the, uh, the gas giant Jupiter. And please, if um, you'd like to interject or add anything as I go along in this talk, you know, please feel free to do so. What's the uh, star closest to Jupiter that's in the G? Um, so that's Aldebaran. Thank you. Yep. And sometimes it's also known as the winter hexagon. So if you kind of take out Castor in that arrangement, you get a hexagon shape, but it's also known as a winter football uh, because it is a little bit like a football shape. And I'd like to mention that because on Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday. So it's kind of appropriate <laughs> um, for this time of year. Also the, uh, the stars of Orion the Hunter, the belt especially can represent the, um, uh, they're the grip or the threads yeah. of the, the football itself, the laces, right? Thank you, Jay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's also the, the outline of a face, and there are two stars that make an eye and a bright nose. <laughs> <laughs> Got it, yeah. I never noticed that before. All right, also in the February sky, uh, we have a, a nice alignment of the Pleiades star cluster. And a lot of people mistake that for the Little Dipper. If you look up in the Southern sky, it does look like a Little Dipper. It's very, very small. Um, the Little Dipper is actually a very large asterism or constellation, but the, the, the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters, also known as Subaru in Japan, um, is a really uh, small little cluster, but it's bright. Um, it is a great binocular object. So if you're looking for things to find in a pair of binoculars, that is a that is definitely a go-to object. So if you move the car, 
it has the stars on the, uh, on the emblem. Correct. Yeah. 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 So that, that's where that comes from. Um, it looks like six stars, really. Um, there's a story behind why uh, one had fleed away from the other sisters in that cluster. But for, for, for my eye, and I think for most people's eyes, we see six, but in a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, there's over 350 uh, bright blue stars within that cluster. So um, beautiful object to observe. Now below that, you've got uh, Jupiter at the other end, but somewhere in the very middle there, you've got Uranus. And apparently on a moonless night, you may be able to see Uranus with the unaided eye. So it looks like a, a bluish green star, um, but it kind of gets lost at a, in a mix of other stars that are out there. So it's really difficult to discern whether or not you're looking at Uranus or just a star, but use a telescope and um, you'll easily see that this is an extended object and not a star like object. Um, in a really big telescope, I've heard claims that you can actually see some details on the cloudy surface of Uranus, although I've never personally seen that. Has anybody in the club ever seen that? Yeah, I, I, I But looking through an eyepiece, I'm saying. Okay. That's what I see. Yeah. One of the things that I'd like to add that can be very frustrating to find Uranus and Neptune because you need a low power eyepiece for a wide field to get in the neighborhood. And then you think you're in the neighborhood and you go to a little bit high power, but it's still star like at the lower powers. Yes. And then you go to a a high power eyepiece, and it will show you whether the dot you're looking at becomes a little disc. But if you're not right on it, you start wandering around with a high power. It could be very, I spent 45 minutes looking for it once and never found it. So if, if you do that, um, don't feel bad if you're frustrated by it because you won't be the first. This is where, this is where go to comes in. Yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> and Jason, you made a good point. Tomorrow night would be a good night and the following night because we're at new moon. Um, so it'll appear brighter than darkness. usual because of the darkness of the sky. And we're supposed to have clear skies tomorrow night. Um, and Friday night, we're opening up the Vanderbilt Observatory and it's supposed to be clear Friday night as well. So um, come down and take a look. I'll, have, I'll give you another reason why you should come down in a moment. Um, but this is a beautiful arrangement of the Pleiades, Uranus, and Jupiter, something to look forward to. And it's out right now. Um, I just wanted to mention that time is moving pretty quickly. Um, you may notice that the, the stars are shifting quite a bit, but if you're an early riser, uh, we're already starting to see the core of the Milky Way start to rise up on the horizon. Um, so on a, on a moonless night, which is this Friday night, the 9th, um, if you go down to say Robert Moses, or if you have a clear view of the Southern horizon, uh, take the time to check out the core of the, the Milky Way. This is, a, this is a sneak preview of what we'll have during the um, early evening in the summertime with the bright star Antares off to the right. And we're already starting to see some of the, the stars of the, the summer triangle um, rising at that time. A wonderful um, website that I frequent is called theskylive.com. Um, it shows you the arrangement of all of the planets in the solar system that is current, or you can, you can change the date and time and see the arrangement of the planets. But what I really like about it is it's a three-dimensional tool that you can use to see um, comets that are in and around our solar system. So right now there's four or five comets that are visible, uh, but the one that I'm curious about right now is Comet 144P Kushida um, because it is high up in the sky in the constellation of Taurus the Bull. Uh, but before I leave the screen, <clears throat> I, I just wanna mention, take the time to visit theskylive.com. I think you'll find it useful as well. And it's theskylive.com. Theskylive.com. Yeah. So here's uh, here's Comet 144P Kushida coming within the Hyades constellation, 
or asterism, I should say. The Hyades represents the face of Taurus, so it's a V-shape. Uh, you can easily see the V-shape on the screen here. And that little smudge there, I know the screen is a little small to see, but that is the comet that's starting to come into the Hyades. It's actually past this point now. And the reason why I brought this up is because it is getting brighter um, slowly. And every now and then you'll have um, outbursts of comets where they can get much, much brighter. But this one is progressively getting brighter. Right now it's sitting at about a magnitude of 10.7. You won't see it with your eye, but with a decent sized telescope on a moonless night, you'll see um, the comet in your in your telescope. So on the, the night of, oh, and here's, um, here's just a display of the wintertime constellations and you can see the bowl, right? So the, that V shape is up and to the right of Orion the Hunter. The belt stars show you the way. So that's star hopping. If you take the belt stars and connect them together and keep going up to the right, you'll hit the Hyades, the star cluster. That star cluster, by the way, is only 150 light years away. It's the closest star cluster to us. And it is starting to evaporate or move apart over time. But Kushida uh, is just below Aldebaran on Friday night. And so take a chance to do that either Friday night or Saturday night, because this is, this is moving pretty swiftly. It won't be near Aldebaran. So it's, it's really cool to be able to see things in a telescope that are paired together. Uh, so in the proper telescope, you'll be able to see both Aldebaran and hopefully the comet side by side. And if you're an astrophotographer, that's a good chance to catch two um, celestial objects that are interesting paired together. How fast is it moving? Like, would it be going a week? Um, yeah, by, by a week, it will have moved well out of the Hyades. But I don't have a I don't have a speed of it or exactly where it will be. Um, but again, if you if you use a program like Stellarium uh, or uh, theskylive.com and change the date, it'll show you its path and where it's going. I like to use both Stellarium um, and and theskylive.com because you can see uh, the, the, the path and the direction and the skylive.com. And then when you use stellarium.com, you can actually see what that effect is on the sky. Um, but in general, they, they go very quickly. Comets move very fast, yeah. But we have, you know, varying rates of comets that come in and orbit around our sun. So some are, some are faster than others. How far away is the I I don't have a number for that either. It might have a distance on your screen, but the text is too small for reading. Yeah, and I don't think so I had it. Eight yeah. What is it? AU. Eight AU. No, they go by AU. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's too small for us to see. Okay, let's uh move onward. Um, so February 9th is new moon, and this is the best time to do observing of deep sky objects or very faint fuzzy objects. So let's talk about some of those items that we can find. Um, we have some autumn leftovers. We have the Andromeda galaxy, also known as Messier 31 or M31, that's still visible. And in order to find that, um, there's a little trick. If you find the autumn square, which is the great square of Pegasus, the square is really easy to see because it's bright and it's just above the Western horizon. <clears throat> if you kind of connect the stars together and figure out a pattern of how to hop to M31, that's how I do it. If I was able to point that out uh, with the tool here, I'd be able to do that. But finding the autumn square is a, a good way to get you to that point. Do you need a telescope to see um, in a really dark sky, you can kind of see it if you avert your vision. So if you look straight at objects, it's really hard to see. But if you looked anywhere around it, you may be able to see it a little bit. Binoculars, Binoculars definitely. And it's a, it's a very large object. It's, ex it, it, it's, it's, it's fuzzy looking. It looks like a cloud. Um, but on a really clear moonless night with really good seeing where there's no turbulence in the air, you can start to see some of the dark dust lanes in, in part of the, uh, the spiral nebula itself. It'll probably be more difficult <clears throat> from where you are in Queens just because there's more light pollution. And it's very faint. 
So that also adds to it. Right. The difficulty. Yeah. But the core of it is mm -hmm. the pain look out. The core you can see can in a telescope. No, maybe not. Maybe not. And where? Oyster in Oyster Bay? Bay? Yeah. Sure. Really? <laughs> okay. Okay, we're all coming to your house. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, We've got we've got somewhat dark skies here. I can see it with averted vision, but it is su yeah. super faint. It's about to all get that was there. Yeah, right. Like, oh, yeah, there's... yeah. Yeah, some of these things are just cool to know that that's what that is, you know. Um, but uh, but definitely binoculars would reveal more, uh, and a big telescope even more. But this is a fuzzy looking galaxy. It's not a it's not like your classic spiral shape that's face on. Um, so, what does it look like? I think the best way to show off what objects look like in a telescope is to look at sketches that are done, not, not necessarily photographs. Photographs, they, they kind of oversaturate or they bring out detail in that object. Um, if, although if you're a really good astrophotographer, I've seen, um, I've seen astrophotography done where it really is an accurate representation, but more often it's not. So then I, I lean towards sketches. And so this guy named Michael Glasov um, built a website called deepskywatch.com where he has all of his sketches on that website. So again, that's deepskywatch.com. And this is his sketch of the Andromeda galaxy. Oh, and um, this is a really good accurate representation, I think on a, on a perfect night. So um, it's amazing that that's sketched. Yeah. There's actually three galaxies in here, right? You've got the main galaxy, which is M31, the big one. But at the top there, you've got Messier 110. And at the bottom, the little satellite galaxy is Messier 32. Um, those fuzz balls. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've had a tough time seeing those, um, at least 32 from our observatory. I think also because schmidt cassegrains do such a small, narrow field of view, you, you kind of need a rich field telescope or a wider field view telescope. Uh, in order to get all three in one eyepiece. Around what time do you see? Uh, so this is early evening. You want to you want to catch this just after sunset because if you wait a couple of hours past that, it will get too low on the horizon. And at that point, also, and we should keep this in mind. Once you start observing objects close to the horizon, uh, seeing gets worse. Turbulence becomes an effect. Uh, better to observe things that are higher up in the sky. I'd say at least. 15 to 20 degrees up. Um, yeah, 6 p.m. would be good. We're, we're in astronomical twilight. Uh, what time is sunset? 5, 5, 15? I think astronomical twilight is dusk is 6.30. Is it? I, th I thought it was closer to 6.10. But the problem is it's going into the west. And of course, for us in Nassau County and Suffolk, and Queens, the West is New York City, so you will get so much light right. coming up. Yeah, um, I mean it's worth trying to see it with binoculars, but don't be disappointed because the chances are kind of remote at that point. Right, and this is why I said Friday night, a moonless night, is probably your best opportunity, or over the weekend too. Yep. So every every Friday night we open up the planetarium observatory at eight o'clock p.m. and we keep it open till ten. So we've got two hours of observing. That's here. That's on the other side of the property in the planetarium. Yep, but up here at the Vanderbilt. Open to everybody. Open to everybody and no charge. Uh, next up, we have an open cluster, and this is my favorite open cluster for some reason. I just think it's really pretty. Um, in the constellation of Gemini, the twins, and that arrow is pointing to exactly where the location is of M35. Um, M35 is uh, an open cluster. It's, um, it's a very old open cluster as far as open clusters go. Open clusters tend to be young. Globular clusters are the old ones. But this one is about the age of our solar system. So it's nearly four and a half billion years old. So again, leaning on the sketches, uh, this is Michael Blasov's sketch of M35. I could just uh, jump in with a quick comment. It's Carl. Uh, yeah, this was one of the objects I looked at the other night, uh, yesterday, 
I tell you, it's it's uh, really it's a very large object. It's surprisingly large compared to like the uh, clusters in Auriga, M36, yeah. uh, 7, and 8. So it was kind of fascinating. I was, I was trying to find a little uh, smaller cluster that's shown here on the right with the binoculars, but I couldn't really spot it. You know what, Carl, it's funny you brought that up because I never even know that knew that that little cluster was there. And I think that's because the, the schmidt cassegrain is such a narrow field of view. And like you said, this object is big and extended. Um, I never had an opportunity to see it, but now I see it in the sketch. Uh, we'll, we'll make a point to try and find that. <laughs> J Jason uh, cousin says he thinks it's his thumbprint. <laughs> Um, somebody somewhere along the way said that they see the space shuttle landing in this cluster. They see what? The space shuttle landing coming in for a landing. Oh, so if you see where that yeah. orange star is, I guess that's the tail wing and it's headed right toward you. And then you've got the wing. Um, yeah, but it's headed down this way. It took me a while to gaze at that and even recognize what they were looking at. But there's some creative minds out there. High in the sky, we have uh, the bright white star Capella in the constellation of Auriga, the charioteer. And um, I think as Ken had mentioned, or somebody else here had mentioned, or maybe it was you, Carl, um, that there are, are three open clusters within that constellation. And sequentially, they're out of order, right? You've got 37, 36, and 38, but this is a great binocular object. And so if you find Capella, just go below it and move your binoculars back and forth and you'll see those clusters. There's a little asterism in there too that I didn't know until I found this picture called the leaping minnow. Um, I guess it looks like a small little fish below M38. So something else to look at. We also have Messier 50, all known as the heart-shaped cluster, um, kind of in between the brightest star, Sirius, and up to the left, we have Procyon, um, and it leans a little bit more closer towards Sirius there. And I think it's appropriate to talk about the M50 cluster, just because this is the month of Valentine's Day, and it's also known as the heart-shaped cluster. And talking about sketches and finding sketches online. Um, Mike Blasov's list was not the whole Messier catalog. Um, so I found uh, Martin Straub uh, from the Netherlands had put together a really interesting list of sketches that he um, processed. So he took it one step further to make it more realistic for what you're looking at in the eyepiece. So he took his sketches, but then processed it to actually match what he was seeing. And I, I never saw that technique before, uh, but this is what he sketched of the, the heart cluster. So it's hard to see on the screen, but it really does look like the shape of a heart. Another Valentine's Day, the actual Valentine's Day event in the sky on February 14th is we'll have a six day old thin crescent moon uh, meeting up with Jupiter in the sky for a sort of a celestial kiss or a meet. And uh, they arrive early. So I, I said here, arrive early to next week's meeting. So next week, next Wednesday is the 14th. If you have a pair of binoculars or a telescope, or you just want to use your eyes, hang out in the parking lot, and you'll see this uh, this this conjunction between a thin crescent moon and Jupiter. This image on Stellarium does it no justice. Uh, the moon won't be spherical shape; it'll be a very thin crescent meeting up uh, with Jupiter. So neat to look at with the the naked eye, or or if you have a pair of binoculars, that may be a, a good object to look at. And then we have two days after Valentine's Day on the 16th, the moon meets up with Subaru or the Pleiades. Uh, unfortunately, we're not in a location on Earth where it will occult or cover the Pleiades, but on, apparently on other parts of Earth, uh, there will be an occultation of Subaru. And if you don't know what an occultation is, an occultation is when a, a large celestial object like the moon uh, covers a smaller object that, that is in the sky. But again, a nice, a nice pairing to, to see. 
So we have a full moon at the uh, end of the month occurring on February 24th in the constellation of Leo the Lion. And um, this is called the full snow moon. So Native American tribes gave names to moons for each full moon for each month. Uh, February is the snow moon. I don't know why they call it the snow moon. It doesn't snow here anymore. <laughs> and when I looked at this, I just realized that the moon is very close to the Leo trio or something known as the Leo triplet. So it's not something to observe on a full moon night, but on the ninth, again, uh, this weekend, uh, the Leo trio is a fascinating object to see. And it's some of the most distant galaxies that you can observe um, in even a small telescope. They're roughly 30 million light years away. You've got uh, Messier 65, Messier 66, and um, a more distant galaxy that's actually not coupled together gravitationally, NGC 3628. But that is also uh, the Leo trio or the Leo triplet. And uh, the more accurate location for that is exactly where this arrow is pointing. Right, so that's, that's exactly where the Leo trio is. So let me quiz you. Mm -hmm. There's the Leo trio at the tail of Leo, but also halfway from Regulus to the start of the tail is another triple. And I don't know which triple is which. The Leo trio is considered the tail one? Yes. Yep. But if you can see that, you continue along underneath the line of Leo is halfway to Regulus, there's three more galaxies. And they're all NGC objects? None of those no, are No, I think it's yet. 95 and 96. Okay, yeah. Um, let's see. I remember being confused because I thought, well, there's three Well, of this them. is 65 and 66. I forget the numbers. Maybe the 90 other ones. or 95. Okay. Um, and then I think another NGC. Um, to also towards the end of the month on February 20th and February 24th, we have a, a, a planetary, not a planetarium conjunction uh, with Venus and Mars. So this is in the, the pre-dawn skies. So if you, like, if you like pairings of objects in the sky, this is something else to look forward to. A conjunction is in the next weekend? Yep, exactly. So we call them planetary conjunctions. Um, something interesting to note this time of the year is if you're looking for the Big Dipper, it's tilted up on its handle. Um, and there it is. It kind of looks like a big backward, I mean, a big question mark in the sky. And to complete the actual Dipper, you know, you have a line from Dubé to um, Migres that completes the Dipper. So if we were to continue on and up, we all know the Big Dipper is big, it's huge, but Ursa Major, the bear that it belongs to is about three times the size. And I like asterisms, I like things that are part of constellations, just they're, they're, they're fun to do. And uh, I heard about this many years ago, but I'd like to share where this asterism is. It's called the three leaps of the gazelle because it looks like um, hoof prints of maybe a gazelle jumping through the sky or snow if you want to think of February. So here's one and these two stars are actually part of Leo Minor which is just above the constellation of Leo to the right but the the toes let me go back here just so you get an idea of what that looked like. You see the the, the feet of the bear he has two toes on each foot so if you include those two stars in Leo Minor and then the two toes of um, the bear, that's the three leaps of the gazelle. Oh, wow. And it's just, uh, it's a pretty pattern to see in the sky. And kind of one of those asterisms that once you've got it once, you'll never forget. Because the stars are at the same angle and distance. Yeah, separate. they're tilted the same and the same separation. So it's neat. Um, the Big Dipper is a great tool to star hop to other things. Um, star hopping is the technique of finding bright constellations, connecting the dots, and then going off. So here is the star hopping trick to find the North Star Polaris. 
But another one that we can use is Nigres Infecta to find Regulus and Leo. So if, if you're trying to find where Leo is in the sky, do this, take Nigres Fecta and keep going and you'll, you'll get Regulus, which is the brightest star in Leo. Um, and Leo, it's funny, it kind of looks like a, a backward question mark. So you've got the big question mark in the sky and the backward question mark on the other side. Um, seeing Leo the lion also um, means that spring is around the corner. You may have heard of the phrase March wars in like a lion. They're talking about the constellation of Leo. Um, but really Leo is, when it rises, it, it's, it's depicting the, or it represents the end of, win, uh, end of winter or mid or midwinter. Always looked like a mouse. A mouse? It's like a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe on here in the real sky, it's a lion. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And so let's change our vantage point away from um, the northeast or south and look a little bit towards the northwest again. Um, we've got Cassiopeia or Cassiopeia, it looks like a big M shape in the sky, easy to spot. And between that M shape and, and Perseus, the Greek hero, the bright star of Perseus is in the middle of that arrangement. I wish I could point this out, but I can't. Um, you'll find a really beautiful double cluster, two open clusters that are side by side. So we call it the, the double cluster in Perseus. For some reason, they are not Messier objects. Charles Messier, I guess, didn't see them or he didn't think they were comets. His job was to look for comets. So it didn't make the Messier catalog. So um, you can find these as M uh, NGC objects or Caldwell 14. Um, so there it is. This is the sketch done by Michael Vlasov, which is absolutely amazing. Um, so this is a this is a big object. You'll need a, a, a rich field or a wide field view telescope in order to see this one. And it's absolutely stunning in the dark sky. It's so brilliant. Actually, this really has a good sense of it. it does projected? It's yeah. Like, yeah. It's, yeah. It's that brilliant. Right. I think that the best star is between the cluster. The red star. Yeah, in the middle there. I don't know what time it is. So, we saw it Sunday night after uh, stars and Sunday night. In the telescope or naked eye? No, in the telescope. Oh, okay. Neat. And it was it was obviously red? Um, I don't know what we came out, but we were able to see. Okay. Um, just a little trick that you can do if you're trying to look for color in stars, I know many of you are aware of this, is you defocus the telescope. So you take it out of focus. So what you're basically doing is taking that, that light that's concentrated that will look more whitish, but once you spread it out, you'll see the color come out. So you could try that on uh, Betelgeuse, try it on Aldebaran. Betelgeuse is actually a kind of a pale uh, orange whitish star really but once you once you defocus it you'll see the red come out so if you're looking at the double cluster like this and you want to see color defocus um, coming back to orion the hunter uh, the belt of orion is an asterism right it's a part of orion the hunter um, but the reason why i'm bringing this up is because i like to point out that during the winter time we don't have a lot of globular clusters to observe most of them are just open clusters, uh, but we do have one that is underneath Orion the Hunter. In fact, below Orion the Hunter is a, another constellation that looks a little like a bow tie shape, which I've drawn out here, known as Lepus the Hare or the Rabbit. But just below the hare, you'll find M79. Uh, so this is, a, this is a globular cluster that's gonna be low in the sky, but if you've got a good view of the Southern horizon, it's worth a shot. Um, a sketch by Michael Vlasov looks like this. So you can see why globular clusters are called globular clusters. And I 
really emphasize the pronunciation because it's not a globular cluster. Uh, it's not a glob shape, although it is a glob. It's a, it's a globular cluster. I've been pr pronouncing it wrong all these years. <laughs> we all call them globs, though, for, for short. <laughs> so I'm comparing the two now. Uh, Michael uh, Vlasov just does a hand sketch. He's not digitizing this in any way. So I'm, I was curious, uh, what did Martin come up with when he did digitize it? It's a little smaller, but I think uh, this is a more accurate depiction of what it actually looks like. So maybe digitizing sketches is the way to go. They also they they probably in two different places that might have different. That's true too. Language. Yeah, that's true too. So it's weird because in uh, the second one, right, there's a pronounced ring of stars. Yeah, and they don't seem to be there in this one. Right. Like what? Oh, that yeah, I think also, you know, we're we're so much zoomed in on this one that that ring may be right out at the edge of the eyepiece. All right, so let's go back again. Oops. So you bring that whole thing back in, and maybe oh, that that yeah. that's it. Right. Yeah, the much wider field of view. I think the digitizing they can really finesse yeah. parts of it where. Mm -hmm. one, uh, I guess in a way a sketch is a little rough. I mean, you've only got a pencil and pressure, but to digitize it, boy, you can just really. Yeah. But the, this is brilliant to see these two different sketches. Yeah. Uh, Martin Martin is from the Netherlands and he got frustrated looking at photographs of objects and just having expectations. Right. And then when he observed, it doesn't meet his expectations. So he wanted to sketch and share with other people, what we can expect to see. Yeah. But he took it one step further halfway through his um, process to start digitizing them. So he can make very subtle changes. Right. That's a brilliant idea for you to show these, really, because the, there's a curious thing. If you look at M13, which is a globular cluster, <laughs> first time I've used that word. Um, it, it looks like, you know, salt spilled on black velvet right in the center and, and going out, but it's not perfectly symmetrical. There are, there are dark lanes, if you look carefully, where there are fewer stars at a few places around this circular thing. But if you go look at a photograph of it, it's perfectly symmetrical and there's no dark lanes. And I heard it explained that when the photographic sensitive stuff, film in the past and digital now, when you make it sort of a long exposure, the fainter stars catch up to the brighter stars and it looks perfectly symmetrical, but to the unaided eye, it's not. And that makes it so much more interesting to look at because you can look for those dark lanes and. I think you had said it in the past, Ken. You, I think you gave a talk on this, is that when you sketch, you're teaching yourself or training yourself to see. Yeah. And it's true. Um, carefully. And I always tell people, take your time. You know, when I'm at the observatory, the longer you look, the better it gets. Yeah. And that goes true with anything you're observing. The sun, anything in a telescope, the longer you look, the better it gets. But when you start sketching, um, you take the time to really pick out detail and your your mm -hmm. mind and eye make a connection where you couldn't do it at just a glance, so. So globular clusters um, are returning in the evening sky in the springtime, um, but early morning stargazers can actually ca catch a glimpse of this. Um, I, don't, I don't, wake up early to go observe. So, you know, kudos to you if you do, uh, but you've got a good arrangement of globular clusters in the early morning sky. Uh, wait until late springtime in the summertime. These are evening objects that you can observe. Globular clusters or globular clusters um, are my favorite objects to observe from Long Island because they're bright, 
they pop in the telescope and they all kind of have their own unique characters, characteristics. Um, so springtime and summertime, I've said in the past that it's the return of the globs. It sounds like an old monster movie. <laughs> Um, another beautiful open cluster can be found in the constellation of Cancer. So this is the midway point between Leo the lion and Gemini the twins. Cancer doesn't have a lot of bright stars. Um, the one in the middle is somewhat bright. That's uh, the, the second brightest star, but above that, and really this is a pretty big object and it's pretty bright too. This is the Beehive cluster, also known as M44. Um, a very popular open cluster, um, also known as Precipe. Um, so here on Stellarium, you can see uh, the blue square is where it marks that location. And so let's see a, let's see a sketch uh, from Martin on that. And again, this is the digitized version. So it's supposed to look like bees swarming around a hive. And this is a pretty big object too. So you need a wide field of view on this. And in addition to a regular beehive cluster, we have a little beehive cluster. And this one is easy to get because it's just below Sirius. So if you do the beehive, you might as well do the, the little beehive too. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire list of everything that we can observe in the month of February, because as you can see, it will go on and on and on. There are a ton of things to see. Um, in the Milky Way, in the arm of the Milky Way, which is just the left of Orion, the hunter, and up, there is just a tremendous list of objects to observe. Uh, but for the most part, you need to get into really dark skies in order to see them um, in a big aperture telescope, because um, they're faint. So, so far I've talked about stuff that are, stuff that's conspicuous and bright and easy to see from lightly light polluted skies on Long Island. So that brings us to Orion the Hunter and Orion the Hunter holds probably the, the most impressive deep sky object for any season. Uh, before I talk about that though, let's talk about some of the asterisms that are in Orion. Uh, the belt, I think most of us know. We also have a shield, which is kind of an odd shaped arc of stars that if you have slightly light polluted skies, you won't see it. So when, we were, when I was walking down here prior to the, our meeting tonight, I tried to look for the shield and we, I couldn't find it at all. Um, so you need a pretty dark sky to be able to see that. Um, and the way Orion Hunter shield has been drawn is with the a lion skin covering the shield. So I guess, that's what causes the irregular shape of the shield itself. And I think if it was a very smooth shape, they'd say, yeah, it was a shield. We don't need to cover it with anything. Uh, but because of that irregular shape, they need to, to cover it with something. Here's a, a, a not well-known asterism. So if you take the belt of Orion, the three stars that hang down represents the sheath for his sword. But the combination of all of those is called the mirror of Venus. Um, in the real sky, it's, it's obvious, it's beautiful. It really does look like a diamond encrusted mirror. Um, and it looks like a, you know, a handheld mirror. So that's the mirror of Venus. Uh, but this is where the great Orion Nebula lies is in that middle star within the sheath of his sword. And of course, I wanted to look at the sketches and here they are. This one is by Michael Vlasov. So no digitization on that. And I really like this because it, it pulls out some of the color that you might see in a telescope. I don't see it at this extreme. I don't know if anybody does, um, but I, you can see subtle green and blues within the Orion Nebula. Um, the four stars in the middle are referred to as the trapezium. So if you're looking at the Orion Nebula, be sure to try and hone in on that trapezium shape. And here's the digitized version from Martin um, from the Netherlands. So he, he's really zoomed in on the trapezium there. And this is a fascinating um, deep sky object. It's a, a nebula, but it's actually three nebula in one. Uh, you have emission nebula, which means it's making light. It has reflection nebula, means it's reflecting light. And the dark 
nebulae are, are, are called absorption or dark nebulae. So you've got three and one. What's interesting about that, above the trapezium, notice the right angle, and that's a sharp right angle. And when I first saw that in photographs and drawings, I thought maybe the other picture is better. Okay. Uh, I thought that can't be. And every time I saw another drawing or another photograph, it just seems it's it's sharper than that is as a right angle. Mm -hmm. And it's astounding that it, with all the gases blown around, that there would be anything that has a sharp right angle in it. But it's right. it's there, so yeah. it's kind of fun to look for that. Steve Melvius and had an email this week with a great shot as well, holding the lion from the great white field. Great. You know, we may not have quite seen it. I haven't yet. I will now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Steve, Steve Bellavia takes incredible images. So this is a quote from a, um, an astronomy enthusiast, astronomy popularizer. His name's Garrett Service. He wrote, and I agree, if we do not gaze at it, meaning the Orion Nebula, long and wistfully and return to it many times with unflagging interest, we may be certain that there is not the making of an astronomer in us. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you, that was spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. What a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, chairs.